problem. There we go. Um, at any rate, uh, so I worked for uh, I went and worked for Raymond James, then I worked for Bear Stearns, and I managed tech portfolios in the late '90s, um, which was great because you managed tech portfolios in the late '90s, everything went up, right? Um, I left and started uh, my own investment bank, uh, and I ran that for 14 years, and we had a a, a, a focus on um, faith-based donation-driven nonprofits, right? So we were the we ended up becoming the largest lender to the Catholic Church in the world. That's why I lent them about 600 million to a billion every year. Um, Mike helped us with a lot of stuff. Uh, thank you, Mike, who's here in the city. And um, uh, he we um, I had an asset management business, a consulting business, and a, and a uh, um, and a fundraising business. I sold that in 14. I became chief investment officer for a university, uh, one of my old clients, and that was not fun. So I left. And so um, we, I went and I was managing money for a Forbes uh, 400 family. And um, we were, I was managing the private equity. And one of our core thesis was that banks were dying, right? And so the traditional function where if you kept somebody else's money, right, you ought to be the person who then originated loans and then made decisions about what loans to make, right? And we said that historical anachronism is not going to maintain itself for long, and lots of other people are going to get into lending and doing functions that banks have done historically. And uh, this is the deconstruction of the historical uh, centralized uh, banking function. And we said, OK, we want to get in on that. This family that I, I managed their money, they had made their money on Wall Street. And we said, how can we get in the front end of that? And so we looked at where, how people were originating loans and how they settle loans. So if you guys ever buy, you know, buying a house or you buy um, a piece of real estate or there's a loan, what you do is you go in, you sign a bunch of documents and you come up with a stack of documents and that's the proof that you either own the asset or that you owe somebody a bunch of money now, right? And, and that's called physical settlement where somebody gives you something, right? Electronic settlement is where, you know, you go through, you, you, he sells me an ice cream cone, I give him my visa, he swipes the visa, it takes money from his account, delivers it to him, he delivers me the ice cream cone. That was electronic settlement. You know what I mean? I got it. But banking is still physical settlement, the physical settlement reality, right? And we said, how can we, as this whole world goes from a physical settlement world, hello, welcome, welcome, good to see you, buddy. Um, the, as, as we go from a physical settlement world to a digital settlement world, how can we be in the front end of that technology, right? And so this is 2015. So we started looking all over the world at um, a bunch of different options. By the way, there's drinks and pizza in the back for the latecomers. You're welcome to it. Um, um, and so we said, we want to be in the front end of that. And, and so we, I had a team go look in Asia, and I had a team go looking in Europe, and I led the team in the US, and we began looking at technologies. And that's when we discovered uh, the distributed ledger. Right? And this is in 2015. And so I tried to get that family to really go all in on the distributed ledger and make a big investment. They didn't want to do it, so I bought the vehicle that we'd done the investing in and stood up a company in 2016, right? So in 20, by January of 2017, I had my full tech team, and in May of 17, we had our MVP of our technology up and running, and kind of we filed all of our patents um, in 2017. But what we w wanted to do was we wanted to create digital financial instruments, right? And I'm going to say a couple different things here that you guys that the traditional blockchain people disagree with us on, right? So I'm going to say some things that a lot of blockchain people disagree on, right? So as an example, the code is the law, right? That's a big thing that you guys hear, right? And we believe the code will never, ever, 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 ever be the law, right? And, and we'll talk about why we say that, right? And now the code makes law high functioning, right? Code is the law is dumb, and it takes a lot of human beings to make it uh, high functioning, but code can make the law high functioning, and that's what we try and facilitate. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So at any rate, what we did is we, we created this, and we, we were the first people to tokenize uh, a third party transaction. So we did a $3.9 million arm's length debt transaction on blockchain. So we were the first people in the world to have done a debt transaction on the blockchain, and we did that in February of 18, right? And so um, we did that February 15 of 18, uh, three months after us. Um, uh, um, so JP Morgan, HSBC, and the World Bank 
we're three months behind us, five months behind us, and nine months behind us uh, figuratively, right? And then you know you have that Daimler $100 million bond that, took, that, that traded for 10 minutes, right? I don't know if you remember that, that did the round trip trade. And so there was a few things done on the blockchain, but we were the first one who did it. And, and then we've done since then 14 different transactions. And the way we think about the blockchain is maybe different than most people, right? Because the blockchain fundamentally is what? It's a data retention system. That's all it is, right? It's a data retention system. And, it, and a lot of people, I remember the first panel I was on at a blockchain conference in 2016, I was sitting on a conference panel and one of the people who was my panelist said, the blockchain is gonna do away with the need for centralized governments. And I was like, no, you're smoking crack, right? That's, no, it's not. It's not gonna do any of those things. It's a data retention system. But it's a really cool data retention system that you can do a lot of different things with. And so what we do is we take all of the data that's, uh, that's, that is associated with the creation of a financial instrument, right? And we don't model transactions as code, we model them as data. And what do I mean by that, right? So when you model something, so in 1993, when data was put on the, on, on the internet, right, it could be read by Excite. In 1995, it could be read by Netscape. In 1998, it could be read by Google. Why, because it could read data. Does that make sense? And it was all the same. If it had been written in code within a captive system, what would have happened? Right? Every, people would have had to constantly be restructuring the data that everybody would be perusing on the internet. Data is long lasting, it, it, it has strength, and it can be used by lots of people. Code is brittle, short lived, and susceptible to attack. Does that make sense? And so, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what does it mean to model a transaction as data. So what we do is we take everything. How you doing? Welcome. Good. We have food and drink in the back. Eh, welcome. And so what we do is we take everything that you need to create a financial instrument, right? So from origination through structuring through distribution and then the performance of the instrument, and we take that. So I want you to think of all the – think of a, a, a real estate transaction where somebody buys and sells a building, right? So think of a big building downtown when that's going to trade hands. Right? It's just been renovated by Dan Gilbert. He goes and sells it to um, some other guy. I was going to, I'm trying to think of. Thank you. And uh, he, who comes in and buys it. When that trade ha happens, you have all of that information, right? You've got title, due diligence, environmental, letter reports, financial information. All of that information is there. What we do is we gather that information in its native form, right? Welcome. And we, uh, it, we gather that information, and then the structuring of that deal, the distribution of it, and then the actual performance of that instrument. And what do I mean by that? You know, when you buy a piece of a building, or you buy a building, we, we have that financial instrument where the performance of the instrument, the payments were made, you file the audit, the compliance certificates, the proof of insurance, all that information is there. Does that make sense? But then also the performance of the asset, right? So an office building, a big office building in downtown New York, it is, it's generating an enormous amount of information. What we do is we take all of that data and we do four basic things. We take all this IoT data that's coming out of it, right? And we take that data and we notarize the data. Just like we notarize the legal documents and the due diligence documents and the payments documents. We notarize it on the blockchain and I'll show you how we do that. Then we index it so you can find it. Then we make sure it's what's called fielded, structured in a way that people can, data scientists can look at it, right? So they can play with it. That, and that's part of the, the validating function. When and say, is this data true? Because when you notarize something, you're not saying is the data true. What are you doing? You're saying the data is complete, right? When you go into a bank and, you, and something gets notarized, they're not saying what you signed is true. They're just saying you signed it, right? On the blockchain, when you notarize a document, just like in a transaction in, in Bitcoin, right? When there's a transaction, nobody's saying that this was a good trade or somebody didn't get cheated. They're just saying both sides agreed to it. Is that right? 
what we're doing is we're doing that exact same thing except with a document that's being uploaded. Then we we run it through an algorithm, typically SHA-256, and there's a checksum. And we store that document where in the payload of the block, there's a pointer to where that document is stored. But we don't necessarily need to turn that document into a picture, meaning a PDF, right? Most times, lawyers turn documents into PDFs for surety reasons, right? So somebody doesn't mess with it. We can keep it in its native state where literally we, every time somebody opens it, we ping and we look at what's in the payload of the block. We run SHA-256 through it and see if the checksums match. And if not, we're going to say somebody's messed with this document. Otherwise, you can use it and know it was the original. But what's the advantage of that? It's in its native state. And because it's in its native state, it's what's known as structured data so that all sorts of machine learning, AI functionality can be done on that document. Does that make sense? So what do we do? We take, we notarize the, doc, the information, and whether that's a legal document from a lawyer or a sensor in a building telling you what the temperature is or the energy utilization of the building or the foot traffic or the key fob data, right? All of this is just data about an asset, right? We take all that data, we notarize it, we index it so we know what's in there and where you can find it. And then we validate it. And what we do by validating is, notarizing is saying is the data complete. Validating is saying is the data true, right? Meaning you signed something, but it was what you signed true. So what we're doing is we can take the data from a building like this and say, here's how much energy it's consuming. Right? Then we compare this using AI automatically without a human getting it involved against the data set of other buildings of like age, like kind, and say, is this normal, right? Is this what you would expect from a building like this? Then we can validate that, put that validation on chain, and then the owner of that data, the building owner, has all of his data notarized, he has it indexed, and he has it validated. Well, as a building owner, you don't need that, do you? You already know that it's, this is the information, but if you ever want to use that data to sell it, that building, that trust has to be commutable. Does that make sense? People need to be able to trust it. So it's not that you're saying it, it's that you, you put the data up when it was done, the blockchain is ensuring that, that it's what was there is the data is complete, and that we're comparing it against another. And then once we do that, we can actually then take that data and start doing things with it. So as an example, you know, we, our first so, kind of first version of our software was done in May of 17. Our second version of our software is going to be done this month. And we're going into production with our big beta users. So we've done 14 transactions, about $102 million of trades on the blockchain of real assets. So we've, we've tested our own system using it ourselves. Then we upgraded the system. And what we're going to now do is we're taking about a billion dollars. So we have five beta partners, but one of them is the largest real estate manager in the world. Um, so they manage real estate buildings. 10 of their buildings, about a billion dollars of real estate, and we're taking the digital proof of ownership. So they don't own it, they manage it for somebody else. And they're taking a digital proof of ownership and they're attaching of the data to that smart contract. And how are they doing it? They're not making a big smart contract. That smart contract is using the write function. And that's all it's doing. Does that make sense? You know, it's just writing instruments to, to, to the blockchain and it's creating a, 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 an event series of data. Well, then we can take all of that data in the event series, and if I want to sell an asset, all of my data for that commercial office building is ready for sale every day of the week, right? Because it's being notarized and it's being validated automatically. So I don't have to go hire somebody like Cushman and Wakefield or CBRE or Jones Lang LaSalle to write up a big investment report because all of the data is ready for sale immediately. Does that make sense? And so I've, I've got all that data connected to the smart contract, then I can in and relate that data to something. And what we're doing is the first real use case is we're pricing the building. We're going to create a model that prices the building monthly, then daily, and knock on wood, by Q first week of Q3, we're going to have daily pricing of an office building. Well, wow, that's pretty cool. Daily price for an office building based on other sales of properties like it, not just locally, but an office building sells in London or Geneva, or Albuquerque, or Orlando, of a like-sized building that your building should compare to, it's going to update the model. Why does that matter? 
your data is always ready for sales and there's a daily NAV. Even though it's not a public asset, boy, that sounds like a public market asset, doesn't it? Right? So we really can't, right? So we, it, for a bunch of different reasons, right? Because there's, um, so um, I'm going to show you how we do it. Is that all right? And, and, and can we get back to IPFS in a minute? Because that's a whole big rabbit hole that if I get into it, I'll, it'll slow us down. Is that all right? So what we're, what we're doing is kind of this first use case is we can do this. Now, why does a business care about this, right? I'm a big bank. And I own an asset, and, and I'm going to get a little bit non, I'm going to get technical in accounting, not technical in tech, right? The, when I hold an asset as a public company, I hold assets as what are called type 1, type 2, or type 3 assets under what's called FASB 157, a Financial Accounting Services Board, right? FASB 157. A type 1 asset is a public asset, right? On a share of IBM, a share of a REIT. It trades, the information's clear, you know what it is. Type two is what's called a marketable alternative. It's an alternative asset, but there's prices for it, so it, it's easy to sell, right? Type three is an illiquid asset, right? That, that's hard to sell. Why does this matter? Because in banks that are too big to fail, and they're doing stress tests on how much money you need to have on capital, what do they do? If you have an illiquid asset, they make you store a bunch of cash against that. Does that make sense? If it's a marketable alternative, you have less cash, right? So what we're doing is, because we're using the blockchain, and all the data is ready for sale every day of the week, and we can give you daily pricing, a public, we only need monthly pricing, but because we can do daily pricing, a public company or a, that owns real estate assets can move that asset on their balance sheet from a type three asset to a type two asset. That means they can up the price of it, right? So I own a building that's worth 100 million, but on my balance sheet, I can a million. But not only that, the amount of capital, what's called capital risk, is high. I move it to a type two, I can immediately bump it to 100 million, so I take a $10 million bump, but I can also reserve less cash. That is a real live benefit to a big corporation and it wasn't possible without blockchain. Yes? So the, the, for, to, for a type 2 asset, you, the, the, the criteria is, is you can carry it at market. It's not the lower of, right? Because you, you can, but it, you can carry it at market and you need four empirical data port sources plus that is informed, that's informing a sophisticated model that is informed by real-time transactions within that market period. So that's the technical, technical definition, right? But so you don't have to carry it at the lower um, for a public company that marks assets to market. So I'm sorry to go into that, but the, the yes, sir. Oh man, fantastic question. That's a great question. I'm gonna show in two slides, is that all right? So here, let me just real quick. So, so what do we do, right? We're at the intersection of capital markets, blockchain, and big data, right? It's a, our, SA, our platform is a SaaS platform um, that are for financial professionals, right? It, it models as data, not code. But what does this do? It creates for private assets, so real estate, right? Think of private equity. Think of private loans, right? What do we do? We can get real-time pricing, broader distributions, broader secondary markets, and portfolio quantum option strategies. What do I mean? So we're talking to a lot of the big stock exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, the Hang Seng, the Singapore Monetary Authority, who will list real estate assets on their exchange. Literally, the New York Stock Exchange will list a real estate asset. Not trade, but for them to report a price. And that's called a technical listing of an asset. Why do they want that? A, they want listings, but the reason is they want to get a couple hundred of them. Why? Let's say you get 200 commercial office buildings listed on an exchange. What can you then do? They can create an index. And once you have an index, because they're watching what's going up and down, you can create a derivative where then somebody can now short office buildings in the southeast 
or you know, or they can go long office buildings in the north in, in New England, or they can go short industrial assets in the Midwest. Does that make sense? And so all of a sudden there's a way for derivatives where people can make bets that they haven't been able to efficiently before. All of this is blockchain because the data has the trust layer of the blockchain making it believable. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So we are, within the next 12 months, we're going to see real estate assets listed on a, on a stock exchange, right? So we're within 12 months. So right now, we, with Bermuda, already have 100% of the documentation ready, and they could list next week if we wanted to use them. But we want our first listing to be on the Deutsche Börse, uh, which is a much bigger exchange, right? But, it, it, I mean, and we're working through those issues right now. So we're within 12 months. So, the, so, so great distinction. When we talk about things listing on the exchanges, they're not going to be traded on the exchanges because we think in the decentralized world, all trades going to happen in an OTC way. You know what I mean? It'll be over the counter, and you'll use um, Total. You guys know you, you know Total, right? We love Total. We think that that is the future of how real assets are going to trade in a decentralized world, right? Their technology is awesome, right? We love theirs. So total is an example of where that's going to happen. But you still need oracles where people are reporting the price. You know what I mean? And so people, you still need that halo, the good housekeeping seal of approval, that I, all of my data meets the minimum standards so I can be on the Bermuda, Bermuda Stock Exchange, the Deutsche Börse, the London Stock Exchange. Does that make sense? And so those are good housekeeping seal of approvals and they're halos. So let me just kind of quickly take you through, right? What does this do? You know, this... Real-time NAV pricing, the building date is always ready. So even though it's not a public asset, it feels like a public asset, right? The data is always ready, right? So it's like a distributed Edgar database, and there's real-time pricing. What's the benefit? We can identify mispriced capital. We can say, I'm looking at all the data, and you're paying more for your debt than this guy's paying for his debt, and your buildings are identical, right? So people who are big real estate companies are going to be able to identify for their clients who's paying too much for their debt. Number two we're going to identify mispriced assets and mispriced markets. So when the price of real estate in Des Moines is trading away from the price of real estate in Wichita, because the data is out there, it's trusted, it's atomized, they're going to do it. Right now, big institutional entities only go into places like New York and Chicago and why? Because they don't trust the data. When they go to a place like Wichita, whoever the real estate magnate of Wichita is that big person until they leave his market. You know what I mean? That big player went into Wichita and just made that guy liquid. You know what I mean? So they don't trust the data. When data gets trusted, big institutional players can go into it. And you're going to see quantitative mechanisms where people are going to go into markets that they haven't been able to go into before. So let me use an example, right? There's a, how many people have seen The Big Short, the, the movie The Big Short, right? So the, remember they talk about those things, CDOs and CLOs, right, where they take all these loans together and they bundle them, then they slice them up and sell them out, right? That's a CLO. Why were those created in the first place? Because I'm in Asia, I'm an Asian pension fund, and I want exposure to middle America. How do I do that? I'm not originating loans myself, so I need a vehicle to buy them. We think all CDOs, all CLOs in the future will go away. Why? Because in the future, you'll be able to write an algorithm that literally that algorithm will search up and hoover up loans as they're being created and as an automatic bot. Well, that can only happen if people who are building the loans are building them for algorithms that they can know, right? So right now, today, if I am starting a cupcake shop, and I live in Yakima, Washington. 
if I'm really good at search engine optimization, on day two of my existence, my cupcake shop can be on the first page of Google. You know what I mean? Because I can game the system, and I can get there, and I'm on there. Why? Even though I don't know the exact algorithm, I'm gaming for what I think the algorithm is, and you can do it, right? To create financial products, you can't do that unless you're in a big enough entity where you have somebody who's picking up the phone and calling their buddy and saying, hey, Mike, who works at Prudential or MetLife or Zurich Re, and saying, what are you buying today, right? And it's literally that archaic, right? What are you buying today? Oh, I'm looking for paper like this. And then I hang up the phone, and I tell my buddy, hey, listen, they're looking for this kind of stuff. Well, if I work for a small shop that doesn't have what's called a fixed income institutional salesperson, what do I do? I'm building a financial instrument that looks like the last one that actually got sold. You know what I mean? Instead of building a financial instrument that looks like an algorithm that MetLife and Pru are publishing, I'm buying stuff that looks like this, right? And then you can customize your financial instruments like that. Does that make sense? But none of that works if you don't trust the data underneath it. Does that make sense? So that's what we're doing. We're creating the mechanisms to do it. And this allows us to reduce or eliminate illiquidity premiums for private assets. It helps us with analysis, presentations, marketplace, and all sorts of other good things, right? So we think so we think just in the top two hundred markets in the US, there's sixteen trillion dollars of commercial real estate. This is not multifamily, this is not industrial, this is not manufacturing, this is just commercial real estate. There's sixteen trillion of that that wants a price. That wants a price every day. Does that make sense? Blockchain makes this possible. Full stop. So what is it that we're creating? We're not tokenizing anything. This is not reg tech and identity tech, right? Identity tech, a security token, we like to distance ourselves and say we are not security tokens. Why? Identity tech and reg tech, identity tech, State Street knows how to do that. Merrill Lynch knows how to do identity tech, right? Now you might, blockchain might have a better solution that makes it slightly incrementally better but you're not solving a problem that they're staying up late trying to figure out. You know what I mean? We're pricing real estate that they couldn't figure out. This is a problem that there's no solution. Not a better solution, there's no solution currently. Does that make sense? So this is where we say a digital financial instrument, which is why we don't talk about security tokens, but in fact, this is a token, right? It's a digital financial instrument that's a digital proof of ownership plus the event series, all the data. Yes, sir. Wait, like three slides. I mean, I'm with you, brother. Yes, sir. No, no, right. We're, we're, we want to allow other people to use Zillow of real estate. We want CBRE or Jones Lang LaSalle or Cushman and Wakefield to be the Zillow of commercial real estate. We want them to use our tools to allow them to do it. And the reason is we're not great valuers of real estate. I don't have the domain knowledge. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. They're going to use our platform to manage the data. That's correct. And so what is the blockchain? And this is, again, going to be something that some of the blockchain people don't like us to say. We say blockchain is a secondary form of data retention. Why? No big corporation today will actually use blockchain as the primary form of data retention. There's regulatory obstacles to it. And oh, by the way, they already have systems that work. You know what I mean? But they're going to start using blockchain now. It's going to deliver them a benefit. And over three to seven to 10 years, blockchain will become their primary form of data retention. But it's, they're not going to just turn off what they're using now and go to another thing. Does that make sense? We're getting them onto the blockchain because we deliver a tangible benefit today. So today, Whenever we go into a big, so we have seven Fortune 1000s that we're in negotiations with to use our software in Q1 and Q2 of next year. When I show them this slide and they see secondary form of data retention, they all breathe a sigh of relief. You know what I mean? Because I'm not asking them to become a religious believer in something that the regulators aren't okay with. Does that make sense? So it's a secondary form of data retention, and what happens is it layers a trust layer onto their statements because when they make all these statements 
nobody cares what they said. People want a form of trust because when they're selling the asset, sellers lie all the time. You know what I mean? And what we're doing is we're saying, hey, this is a mechanism to validate the d data, not all at once, but in short intervals, so that the more times it happens, the trust builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. Um, so, um, maybe at the end, if somebody, Adam, if you can remind me, let's talk about the other types of, like Hedera hash graph, right? Any of those forms of a distributed form of data retention works, right? MIT, there's a new, there's a new, um, kind of atomized form of distributed ledger where you can control your data at the end of a node. That's pretty cool, and we're talking to those guys. Um, but um, but let's talk about that at the end, kind of other, next, next, kind of next. Um, and then we use short interval audits, right? But the big benefit of this is we move from databases to data ecosystems, where a building owner owns all their own data and in order to get some pricing or assessment of it, they don't have to give their data to a database and then they lose control of it. Does that make sense? They always own it and they relate it to a data set, but then as soon as it comes back to that, as soon as they relate it to the data set, it comes back to them, right? And we talk about this, and I'll show you this in a, couple, in a few minutes. How many know what, how, do all of you know what a zero knowledge proof is? Okay, so there's, enough, there's a couple notes. So a zero knowledge proof is I walk into a bar, right? And he, and I, he says, I want to prove you're 21. I show my ID, right? And when I show my ID to prove I'm over 21, all sorts of other data leaked out, right? He now knows my birth date, he knows my home address, all sorts of other data leaked out, right? A zero knowledge proof is I show him my ID or gray, right? I, no other knowledge was distributed, right? You know what I mean? But a zero knowledge proof is in business, how can you, without leaking any of your data, make a, 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 an argument of knowledge, right? In crypto, we talk about a ZK snark, right? Which is a succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge where people are using what's called a, a matching summation where you see data, but you don't actually see any of the, the data on an individual basis where you could reverse engineer the performance of the asset. I, using my Goldilocks, Goldilocks analogy, call that the too soft version, right? It's an argument of knowledge, but it's not good enough. The other end, you have Google's tinfoil. I say that's the Goldilocks too hard version. If, I don't know if you guys know what tinfoil is, but it's a version of interacting with data that's tough. So we created our own form of zero knowledge proof called a zero knowledge we call it ZK raised. It's randomized anonymous, anonymous interaction with specific data sets. So it's a ZK raised that we use as a mechanism where people, we can interact with people's data sets. But you don't get to see anything that's below them. So I'm going to keep going. So we, the building, we notarize, index, validate, we price it. I'm going to keep going quickly. We, we then, you know, we bridge to a decentralized data ecosystem moving beyond databases. This forms, this Centuries form a certification, easier to structure, price, socialize, buy, sell, settle, and analyze. Big market. And so this is, the, we call this the, the one chart to solve every chart, right? You know what I mean? So the building asset owner makes the building smart. We do the implementation. We notarize it on the blockchain. I'll, I'll actually show you an example. We index the data that goes to a data repository. We field the data, we validate it using AI and ML against the data pool, and then we price it. But where we, we socialize it, this pricing model could be a risk model. This could be a matching model. It could be a whole bunch of different things. We're pricing the real estate or the private debt or the... 
that's right, our CRE partner, our commercial real estate partner, whoever that is, is going to use their pricing model. And what they do is they correlate the asset to the model periodically, every month, every three months, right? They've got to correlate the model to the, the asset to the model. What does that mean? A building that's on 57th and 5th Avenue in New York is worth a lot more than a building on 30th and 3rd, right? The, the location matters. Is there blight next to it? Is there an elevated train in front of it, right? So a model only works in relationship to the real world where you can correlate, where a, a subject matter expert can correlate it to the model. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to implies consent, right? So, uh, the, and so we, you know, what we do is our, we also take every global transaction of life's assets and we report it into that so we can get a sense that it's a good asset, right? So this is our leadership team. You know, here's what our, our assets look like. But we think the whole world is origination, structuring, distribution, and performance where we literally can look at all of these different things and, and then we can, you know, we can really look at data validation. We, we've got pricing models and we can do this NAV publication. Now in this pricing model, you know, all of our data is what's called ISO 8160 compliant and so we're what's called a FIGI node. FIGI is the Financial Instrument Global Indicator which is Bloomberg's open source data, right? So everything that we store with a flick of a switch, a building owner, can have their building, all of their data, listed on Bloomberg. That's pretty cool, right? So that your individual asset can be seen on Bloomberg, right? And what does Bloomberg rely on? The data that's on the blockchain, right? And that, that, that cycle and this NAV publication. Um, so this is kind of... All right. All right. Sorry. Um, so this is kind of what the NAV process looks like, right? We look at global transactions. They report. There's a selection of like assets. Then we take open market information, and we put it into a privacy manager, right? We look, all of that's there in a privacy manager. The whole world can see the pricing model. They can see how do you determine the price, but they don't get to see any of the data from inside the building, right? So how much free rent you gave, what are the rent escalations, how much you put into renovations, right? All of that data sits behind a privacy manager where you've got valuation appraisal, the periodic assessment, we create a price, but then the publisher of the price, it might be the New York Stock Exchange, it might be somebody else like that, they do a sample audit of some of the data and we let them actually see the underlying data. They can see that it's been notarized and validated. Then they agree, yep, that I, I sampled five. I did a sampling audit, and then I can publish that price. And then once it gets published, it goes in and it, it, it creates and informs part of the public market info. Why does, why does this matter? Right now, the way, and I forget who asked this question, in a traditional real estate appraisal, what do they do? They do an argument of value in what's called a compilation argument, right? Floor by floor, what's the tenant, what's their credit risk, how much do they pay, how much did you pay for the building, what were the improvements, then all that data is there. And it's a proof by compilation. And then literally people can look at any piece of data and say, yep, that's right, I believe that. The problem is every time a value, 100% of that data leaks into what right? So all of a private business owner's Building data is in CoStar, and building owners hate that. They hate it, but they know that as soon as I get an appraisal, it's all going to go in there. So what do they do? Sometimes they don't get appraisals for five, six, seven years, which means the bank, because they haven't had appraisal in five years, their cost of money gets higher. Does that make sense? For the sake of privacy, they pay more. What we're saying is the blockchain can give you access to lower cost money on a real-time basis. And what we do is we take all the data from the building's portfolio management system or property management system and the building information management. This is smart building. This is, the, did the tenant pay their lease? Did you pay your tax bill, right? So those are the two systems. We take all that data through APIs. We put it in a graphical um, dashboard and an event series database. 
that we notarize, index, and validate using just really simple AI. It's a high, low, two sigma system, right? But this is what we're doing. These are the transactions we've done to date. Um, but again, we are not a reg tech or identity tech. We are not a proprietary token standard. We're not an exchange platform. We're not a global commercial bank. We are a data management system. We're a blockchain system. You know what I mean? Where you get data that can interact with data sets. And we're, we, we have a tool that we literally are going to give away for free to the whole world. Tokenize anything you want. Here it is. Use our system. Tokenize anything you want. Structure the data any way you want. But if you want to relate that data to another data set or validate it, you got to pay me a nickel. Does that make sense? Or if you want to sell it, you got to pay me another nickel. Or if you want to price it, you got to pay me another nickel. Does that make sense? That's kind of how we do it. And so we think our competitors, we say Navara is, is a really good competitor in London. They're very smart, but they're focused on creating their own language, which we think is a dead end, right? They, they went most of the way of componentizing the creation of a, a financial instrument. But then at the very end, they said, but we're going to create our own language. We said, stop, don't, you know, why would you do that, right? but we're happy because they're a competitor if they're going down a wrong route, right? <laughs> the other version of this is Carlisle's collateral analysis system, which is in what's called the CMBS market or the commercial mortgage-backed securities market. This is the system that everybody uses. This is our real competitor. This is what everybody uses today. This is who Carlisle CAS clients are. That's a pretty freaking good list of clients. You know what I mean? Lever literally every bank in the world uses it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you forward here real quick. Th so this is what their system looks like today. This is how you connect, query, and import. Literally, this is off their website today. This is phenomenal 1998 tech, right? I mean, you look at this and you say, that's unbelievable, right? For us, we can literally price a model using any type of model you want. We can model it. We can compare it to anything. We can import data feeds from any type of data input you want to structure. We'll relate what the impact of that data feed is to the price of the model. We can tell you actively is the, that data feed active or not active. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, we're moving it into this, this century. We can, we, can, we, can so, we can source the authenticity. We can have everything on the blockchain. Um, and this, this example right here, one of our first betas, is we are tokenizing, so we've got five really cool betas, but our betas is we're tokenizing microfinance loans in East Africa to win the average loan between $75 and $500. Arrow in groups, most of these people are functionally illiterate, right? They're non-bank, but one of the reasons micro lending has never grown dramatically is they keep everything on paper and fraud is rampant. You know what I mean? So they lend money. You have a book, right? Every time you make a payment to me, I write in your book. But you don't see what I wrote in mine, and I can keep two sets of docs. You know what I mean? And there's a joint and several. And so there's a huge turnover in people who manage these groups because the loans are joint and several. We're literally putting them all on the blockchain. All of them can see how much was paid the moment it gets recorded. And the, the, the mechanism of recording that the payment was made, you know what we're doing? Is we're taking a picture of the woman giving the cash. And then we show it to her. Is this you? Is this the amount of the cash? Yes, that's the recording. She doesn't need to see the, the you know, she sees the amount, you know what I mean? And, and they, they can, they're, they're fully literate for that. Does that make sense? But they don't see a general ledger. Isn't that, it? so anyway, we think that's pretty cool. Um, so this is what we're doing. We can index it, we can timestamp it, but I'll, I'll, and I can go through and show you all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm gonna take you back and show you one last thing. We did a transaction in Miami that we were building, that we were doing that was a very public building. That deal has not closed yet. And it won't close until SoftBank is done buying WeWork, right? We just happened to choose a really dumb building to use first, right? Um, so that building is still going, but we marketed it. We, so right now we have about 100,000 people mapped, 40,000 crypto, 40,000 traditional managers, 20,000 intermediaries. 50 profiles that are known in our database. We took 20,000 where we had loaded verified targets and we, we reached out to 20,000 potential buyers of that $65 million building. We had 15,000 email addresses reached. 
4,000 pro prospects engaged, 20,000 page views, 1,000 clicks. Of those, we had 1,000 qualified leads that were what are called quibs or QPs. A quib is someone who has 100 million or above, a QP is someone who has 25. So we're dealing with institutions. 200 top prospects, 60 of them were active deal participants meeting in our deal rooms where their lawyers were looking over our docs. And we got 187 million of indications of interest from 14 entities. And all of that happened in two weeks, all electronically. Imagine what you would have had to have done if you were doing that manually. It's amazing. Now, our lawyers from uh, who helped document that deal, we actually executed the sale documents, right? And the deal blew up two days beforehand because the lenders were getting spooked about we were. Do you know what I mean? So that whole thing, but that's that's what the data existing digitally that people can trust in a deal room and that data can be socialized can yield. We were we were buying the building. We were buying the building. We were the general and we bought it we were buying it for sixty seven sixty five million. We were the general partner, and we were looking for limited partners to come in with us to buy the building. And so we got a 187 million of indications of interest for 65 million. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we we're chain agnostic. We can use any chain that accepts data in the payload of a block. Right now, we're using Ethereum. But we're getting ready to begin using EOS as a secondary chain. Because we believe that we need to be using at least two chains at all times. Because if one chain begins to deteriorate, which will happen because some new thing gets created that's really cool, right? Some chain begins to deteriorate. We're going to have to be using two chains at once in order to transition the trust to a new chain. So we're, we're printing on two chains at once. Does that make sense? So if we're going to move from one chain to 